Hello, and welcome to Doctor Who's Crown Jewels. This is a new series I'm going to be doing on this channel over this year to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Because I love this show, I want to pick out my favourite stories from each season and possibly beyond. My belief is that no matter how awful you may think the show is, there is still always a diamond in the rough. A crown jewel, if you will. Where better to begin than the beginning, the first season, and I have some interesting thoughts on the season. I, I, I just love it. I love it. I love it. I'd argue it's the perfect start to the show. We're given an endearing dynamic between the four leads with the Doddery Doctor, the um, inquisitive and, yeah, inquisitive Susan, the very empowered Barbara, and the very strong-willed, determined to solve injustices, Ian. And uh, as you can tell, Ian's my favourite companion of this of this uh, season. And as for the stories themselves, uh, again, I largely find them great, such as the first part of An Unearthly Child, which I would say is an honourable mention, given how it's a perfect setup to the show with real intrigue, but it's only really an honourable mention for this video, considering... The next three parts are probably the weakest of the season. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really into the caveman politics. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite dull. I've got to admit, that's quite dull. The Daleks, the first Dalek story, put the show on the map for a reason. I really like how it's able to horrifically entertain the audience for most of its runtime. The Edge of Destruction is a very creative way to fill the uh, two episodes with uh, some very trippy sequences. The Keys of Marinus is a nice trek around an alien world that really has so many ideas brimming in each episode. And the Reign of Terror is a quite relevant finale. Not just with the Doctor as a character, but from what we could learn about the French Revolution. Admittedly, the sense rights isn't all that, but I do think it starts quite strong and is very intriguing as well. It just, oh, it's, it, its final episode was really not needed. And that leaves two stories that I haven't covered. Uh, and they both happen to be written by John Lucarotti. Uh, and happen to be historicals. These are the two stories I consider the crown jewels of the season. Those being Marco Polo and, my personal favourite First Doctor story, the Aztecs. Marco Polo. It's a seven-parter, but unfortunately it's mostly missing. I would say it's an epic story that really does not feel like it's dragging. It's a seven-parter, so it is quite long. Uh, so was the Daleks uh, a few weeks prior. However, the difference between the Daleks and Marco Polo is that the Daleks, it has a strong idea that can last a good while. However, it doesn't feel as jam-packed as Marco Polo, even if it was cut down to like six parts, which I think it should have been. I understand why stories are the length that they are, but uh, in an ideal world, you know, the Daleks would not be any more than a six-parter, but Marco Polo really fits seven. There is not a single moment in the story where I feel like nothing is happening. It's unfortunate that it's missing, because I do genuinely think it would be heralded if it if it was not missing. I'll just sum up the plot in case you haven't uh, experienced it, which I urge you to. I really do. I recommend the black and white uh, reconstruction that Loose Cannon did over the color one. Or even for part one, Josh Schnez's one. They really did a good one. So, the basic premise, and this is going to sound really reductionist, because it's, it's so simple of a plot that you're, you'll question how they managed to get seven episodes out of this. The Doctor and co. land in the plane of Pamir. Unfortunately, the ship is damaged, but luckily, Marco Polo and his crew just so happen to be there. However, Marco Polo is scheming something. He is gonna trade the TARDIS for his freedom because he is under some form of control by the mighty Kublai Khan. And he is willing to offer it as a gift because he's desperate. He's desperate to get home. 
And there's a lot of tensions between Marco and the TARDIS team to do with this. And that's the main thing that Marco Polo excels in. Character. The character work is not really something people go on about in Classic Who. It's definitely there. And that's my favourite part about Classic Who. The characterization When it's good, oh my god, I'm in love with it. And it's weird, like, it's very low-key, it's not the focus, unlike with New Who. However, in Marco Polo, it very much is the focus. The way the characters interact, and the way they kind of backstab each other. Especially the Warlord Tagana, who acts as more of the villain of the piece. Because he is very much against everyone being alive. Especially the TARDIS team, he considers them evil spirits. I think the other notable side character in this story is Ping Cho. Her main goal is to give Susan something to do, and that she does. They're in love. Don't argue with me. They're in love. Just as Ian and Barbara are in love, okay? Ian and Barbara, when the straights are okay, Susan and Ping Cho, yes. <laughs> Like, it, it very much feels like their two girlfriends having some fun, Susan trying to help Ping Cho get away from an arranged marriage. Again, when I say it's about character work, I mean it. They let the character work evolve. And not only that, I've not mentioned Ian and Barbara yet. Ian and Barbara, I mean, I've not really mentioned the Doctor yet either, but shush. Ian and Barbara both get to utilise the fact, uh that they teach the studies that they teach. Barbara very much knows Marco Polo's life. She knows the history of Café, and yeah, she knows what should happen. And Ian very much is the logical-minded person who's very skeptical of a lot of things. That's Ian's defining character trait. He's very skeptical. Because he, because he's a science teacher. He, he knows that not every solution is clear-cut, and if something is suspicious, it probably is. There is scientific stuff in the story. Like, for example, when they've ran out of water, Tagana went scouting for an oasis, he found one, and just left the others for dead. Again, he's obsessed with everyone dying. But if it wasn't for the Doctor and Susan discovering that because it was so bitterly cold the previous night, and it was so warm that day, that the condensation was run had ru water running down the TARDIS walls, they collected the water, and Ian explained it in simple terms to Marco Polo, and it was, it was great. Uh, the characters themselves, the side characters themselves, are also very deep. Marco Polo feels very human. Also, the Doctor's a bit of a twat in this. <laughs> Which he would. His ship's being offered by someone else, and you can't exactly get another one. Thing is with Marco, we understand his plight. So obviously we root for the TARDIS team being free, but we, but because he's very written very sympathetically, we also root for his freedom as well. It is a bit of a slow burn, but there is always something happening, and... You know, it really gives you enough time to digest it, to the point where that doesn't become an issue. And for that reason, Marco Polo is a crown jewel. So is the Aztecs. Yeah, I do believe John Lucarotti is the best writer for the First Doctor, or rather, the First Doctor's era. All three of his scripts are in my top ten Hartnell stories, and <laughs> it's two of them, the ones in season one, were my absolute favourite. Which makes me think that David Whittaker had something to do with that. I mean, David Whittaker was a king of characterization in very early Doctor Who. So, naturally, I do feel like the partnership between them made something special. Although I praise Marco Polo for its characterization, the Aztecs, although it also naturally has great characterization, that's not the only thing it has going on. It has multiple elements. Characterization world-building, philosophical concepts, and it bounces them all perfectly, I'd say. In this story, we do see Barbara in her finest hour. I will say this is the story that handles Barbara the best. Because the plot of this one, they land in an Aztec temple. A tomb, even. It's the tomb of an Aztec priest, and because 
Barbara looted it and wore a bracelet she liked the look of. The Aztecs declared that she must be a reincarnation of the god Yataxa. Because of this, she quickly gets influence in the Aztec society, as do the TARDIS team, as they are the servants of Yataxa. Thing is, Aztec society was Barbara's speciality. And although Susan and naturally the audience would be a bit sceptical of the Aztecs, considering they were infamous for their human sacrifices, Barbara sees a different Aztec society. Naturally, there was human sacrifices. Well, she believes that because the Spanish saw that, that their society was doomed to fail as a result of their reliance on sacrifices. But there was other aspects to their culture as well. I mean, naturally, there were warriors, but there was also builders and other things. I don't think the story described the entirety of Aztec society in too much detail, but there are small aspects that I can't just do sweeping statements of. There are aspects of society that Barbara sees in the Aztecs that are beautiful and that culture should be preserved. So what she decides to do is, with her new power and influence, she tries to stop the sacrifices from happening by declaring that the gods no longer favour it. And the High Priest seems to go along with it, because the High Priest was only really allowing for these sacrifices to take place due to the fact that that's what he believed the gods wanted. And because a god has said no, he is against it. However, the Chief Executioner doesn't like this. He likes murder. He likes people dying. So, <laughs> he naturally declares that he believes that Barbara is a false goddess. And that's where all the tension lies. And it's a four-parter, so naturally this storyline fits definitely a shorter time span, but the four parts do give us time to explore the Aztec society. The Doctor also doesn't philosophically agree due to his perception of time. Naturally, he would be against murder and sacrifice, but that's the culture of the time, and if that were changed, well, he can't change time, he just can't. And doing that not only endangers the future, but it also endangers them because they're creating enemies. To the point where they're even banned from the temple apart from Barbara. And that makes Ian conscripted to their army. Susan's sent to a school where they teach her how to be an Aztec woman. And the doctor's just sent to the place where all the old people go, and then he uh, seduces a woman to the point where he gets engaged. I am not kidding. <laughs> I wish I was. And it's Hartnell as well. But it works. <laughs> Some people think this story has pacing issues, and although I don't think the pacing is as strong as in Marco Polo, pacing isn't everything. You could have the perfectly paced story, and it still be terrible. But I do feel like... It makes up for that with, you know, the character interactions, the character motivations, and how the society is explored. How the side of Tatoxel and the side of uh, the TARDIS team clash. And Ortlock is also a fascinating character we get to see, the High Priest. He's very interesting. And also Kamek is lovely. She's just a lovely lady, and no wonder the Doctor seduced her into being... Uh, his fiance. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think the icing on the cake is that I can watch the Aztecs endlessly. I remember when classic Doctor Who was being streamed on Twitch, I watched it in the evening, and then I watched it the following morning, and I didn't get tired of it. There's, there's less to talk about with the Aztecs because it's a lot shorter, but I love it. That and Marco Polo are what Doctor Who can be to me. The John Lucarotti stories in season one are the crown jewels of season one. Next week, uh, because hopefully next week, I'll be discussing the crown jewels of season two. Um, be prepared for more historicals. Hartnell's historicals are amazing. But what are your thoughts? What's your favorite story of season one? Do you agree that John Lucarotti uh, was the MVP of the Hartnell era in terms of just writers they commission? Uh, do you think a lot of the reasons why I love his stories are to do with David Whittaker? 
do you think I am silly and that the th the rest of an unearthly child is the best or the sense rights is the best? Leave your thoughts down in the description comments below. I said the wrong thing. I don't care. I'm not doing another take. And yeah, I'll see you next time with Season 2's Crown Jewels. Talk to you then. Oh.